Okay, so today we will continue talking about the silicate clay minerals and we finished talking about the one-to-one -one type last time. Today we will start talking about the two-to-one. This is a review. Uh, you have already taken this in the undergraduate course, but because it's so important, I go over it again. Remember, one of the good references for you is the nature and properties of soil, a textbook called that, and I've told you about it. This material is covered very well in that, besides your book too. Two to one type silicate creamers. The crystal units in two to one clay minerals are characterized by one octahedral sheet sandwiched between two tetrahedral sheets. So we have two tetrahedral sheets between them, one octahedral sheet. Four general groups of silicate clays have this basic crystal structure. So we have four different types. Two of them, smectite and vermiculite, include expanding type minerals. And the other two, fine micas, which are called also in the old days and sometime until today, elite, and it has some other names in your textbook, and chloride are relatively non-expanding and we will see why are these differences. First we start with the expanding two to one type silicate clays. We have the smectite group in contrast to the situation just described for kaolinite, just described, we described it in last lecture. In the two to one structure of smectites both the top and bottom planes of each layer consists of oxygen atoms. So we have tetrahedral and tetrahedral on both sides. So that means you have only oxygen, no hydroxyl groups. Therefore, adjacent layers are only loosely bound to each other by very weak oxygen to oxygen and cation to oxygen linkages. We don't have the hydrogen bonding that we talked about in the one-to-one -one type clay minerals. We have only very weak Van der Waals type forces. So these are not held together strongly. Adjacent means the one next to it, immediately next to it. Exchangeable cations and associated water molecules are strongly attracted to the spaces between the layers, the interlayer spaces. So the exchangeable cations and the water that's with it because you cannot have exchangeable cations without water. Everything has to happen in the salt solution medium so they can go inside between these layers and they are strongly held to the surfaces of these layers the crystal expands as the water pushes apart the layers so the water goes between the layers along with the cations with it and it pushes apart these layers so it makes the silicate clay minerals the two to one to expand. The internal surface area thus exposed by far exceeds the external surface area of these minerals and contributes to the very high total specific surface area. So because you have these expanding, that means every time two crystal units or two layers expand, there are two surfaces exposed one on each of these layers. So that gives you a very high and large amount of surface area, which we call internal between the crystal units. The external, remember in the one-to-one -one like kaolinite, the surface area is only the top surface area, the bottom of the crystal and the sides. Here we have internal surface area, two surfaces are exposed between each two layers that are adjacent to each other. And this area, of course, if you count how many, every time you have two surfaces between every two layers, so this internal surface area is a lot more, by far exceeds this, much larger than the external surface area of these mirrors. And this contributes to the very high 
total specific surface area of these minerals. Okay, we'll continue on this. Mectite group is noted for interlayer expansion. We already said that, which occurs when water enters the interlayer spaces in relatively dry clay, forcing the layers apart. So if you have dry clay and it's wetted, when water gets in touch or in contact with the clay minerals, it expands, it pushes them apart. This expansion with interlayer water contributes to the very high degree of plasticity, stickiness, and cohesion for which smectites are well known. These characteristics, you remember we said plasticity is the uh, availability, sorry, the ability to be formed, to be shaped. When you hold it in your hand, you can shape it in different forms. So that's plasticity. It's not coming from plastic. It's the ability to be formed in different shapes, stickiness, how it sticks to other things, and then cohesion among itself, how it sticks to uh, its own. Uh, so these characteristics are always related to, other, to the amount of water the clay can absorb on the surfaces. So the higher the surface area, the higher the amount of water they will absorb, and the higher these characteristics. Montmorellonite is the most prominent of the smectites in soils, although beadleite, nontronite, and saponite are also found. So, Montmorellonite, easy, just like it's written. Montmorellonite, beadleite, nontronite, saponite. So, Mont Montmorellonite is the most prominent of this group, the most common that you can find in most soils. Crystals of smectites have a high amount of mostly negative charge resulting from isomorphous substitution. So the isomorphous substitution, which we talked about last time, is the main reason or the major source of the uh, negative charges on this mineral or in this type of minerals. Most of the charge derives from magnesium ions substituted in the aluminum positions of the octahedral sheet. So generally we have an aluminum octahedral sheet. Magnesium takes the place of many of the places of, occupied by aluminum. So divalent taking the place of trivalent. This leaves a negative charge for each substitution. So some also derives from sub substitution of aluminum ions for silicon in the tetrahedral sheet. So we do have in both sheets substitution, but most of it is in the octahedral sheet. The second type of the two to one type expanding group is the vermiculite group. The most common vermiculites are two to one type minerals in which the octahedral sheet is aluminum dominated, dioctahedral. We will talk about, I will explain to you, the, we have seen the dioctahedral, trioctahedral, we will talk about them later. But some magnesium dominated trioctahedral vermiculites also exist. The tetrahedral sheets of most vermiculites have considerable substitution of aluminum in the silicon positions, giving rise to most of the very large quantity of negative charge associated with these clays. So remember, in the smictites, we talked about most of the substitution was in the octahedral sheet. In this, in the vermiculite, the tetrahedral sheets are where most of the substitution occurs, where aluminum, trivalent, takes the place of silicon, which is the normal ion to find in the tetrahedral positions giving rise to most of the very large quantity of negative charge associated with these clays. And always remember, whenever you hear large isomorphous substitution, always the end result, what ends from that, what is the result of that? 
very high negative charge. And what's the result of that also? High cation exchange capacity. These are results, logical. High substitution, high negative charge, high cation exchange capacity. So the cation exchange capacity of vermiculites usually exceeds that of all other silicate clays, including smectite. So they have very high because of this considerable, which means very high substitution of aluminum for silicon in the tetrahedral chain. The interlayer spaces of vermiculites usually contain strongly adsorbed water molecules, aluminum hydroxy ions, and cations such as magnesium. Concentrate and think about this. The interlayer spaces, remember, in the case of smectites, nothing was there. Water and cations come in and leave as it's wetted and dried. Here, the interlayer spaces, the spaces between the different layers or crystal units of vermiculite usually contain strongly adsorbed water molecules, aluminum hydroxy ions. What are the aluminum hydroxy ions? They are, they are the ALOH carrying two positive charges or ALOH2, two groups of hydroxide attached to the aluminum and leaving one positive charge. These are the aluminum hydroxy ions, which result from the uh, hydrolysis of aluminum in water. And cations such as magnesium, so we have water molecules, Al hydroxy ions, and cations such as magnesium. They are in the interlayer spaces, remember? However, these interlayer constituents, what are the interlayer constituents we're talking about? Like we said, water molecules, aluminum hydroxy ions, and magnesium ions. These are the constituents that are between the layers of this mineral or this type of minerals, they act primarily as bridges to hold the units together rather than widges driving them apart. When you have something in between two other things, it can have the purpose of either holding the things together, like when we have a bridge, if you have a valley or we have something, <coughs> sorry, and you want to cross from one side to another, you build a bridge. So the bridge holds things together. Or if you want to have a witch, something that pushes things apart, just like what the uh, builders put between stones, if you have seen them, those pieces of wood, these are widges. So what do these constituents act like? As bridges to hold things together or as widges? No, they act more like ridges to hold the units together rather than instead of widges driving them apart. So if they act like bridges holding together, that means they will stop the layers from expanding. It will stop these layers or crystal units to get apart. So it holds them together. So the degree of swelling and shrinkage is therefore as a result of this so as a conclusion because of that considerably less for vermiculites than for smectites for this reason vermiculites are considered limited expansion clays expanding more than calonite but much less than smectite so they are limited expansion they do expand but not like the fully expanding spectite, but also they are not as fixed like the colonite that like the to one, like the one to one. So they are in between. Now we go to the last group, which is the non-expanding two to one silicate claimers, and these are also two types. The main non-expanding two to one minerals are the fine grained micas and the chlorides. The mica group, the biotite and muscovite are examples of unweathered 
micas typically found in the sand and silt fractions. So these are primary minerals. When we talk about biotite and muscovite, these are primary minerals, okay? They are the N-weathered micas, the primary minerals. Where do we find usually primary minerals? Most of the time in the sand and silt fractions of the soil. The more weathered fine-grained micas, the one that weathered more, they, they resulted from the weathering of these minerals and by a process called alteration, they form the fine-grained micas, such as elite and gloconite are found in the clay fractions of salt. They became secondary minerals after this weathering. Not anymore primary minerals, they change structure and still close in structure to their cousins. We will talk about it in a minute as they call them cousins. But now they are in the secondary minerals, in the clay fractions of soil. Their two to one type structures are quite similar to those of their unweathered cousins. They call them cousins because the structure, general structure, is not very far different, although it changed quite a bit, but still you can tell the general properties of that structure are the same. So their cousins are these, the biotite and the muscovite, but the weathered one are the fine-grained micas. Unlike in spectites, the main source of charge in the fine-grained micas is the substitution of aluminum in about 20% of the silicon sites in the tetrahedral sheet. So again here, we have very high substitution of aluminum trivalent for silicon in the tetrahedral sheets. Every time an aluminum substitute for a silicon, you have a negative charge. You have in not enough charges to neutralize the oxygen charges, so you end up with a net negative charge. Remember, again, what I have said a little earlier, high isomorphous substitution, that means you expect very high negative charge and then high cation exchange capacity. However, the first two things are correct. High substitution, of course, it has to result in high negative charge. But do these minerals have high CEC, cation exchange capacity? We will see, no, they don't have it. Why is that? This results in a high net negative charge in the tetrahedral sheet, even higher than that found in vermiculites, which I have just said. The negative charge attracts cations, among which potassium, just the right size to fit snugly into certain spaces, hexagonal holes that exist between the tetrahedral oxygen groups. So in this type of minerals, potassium ions, which are, of course, cations, they have positive charge, and they are there to neutralize these negative charges. But because of their right size to fit snugly, snugly means very tight, into the hexagonal holes between the layers of these minerals, this potassium is held so strong it does not allow expansion. So adjacent tetrahedral sheets are therefore strongly bound together by their mutual attraction to the potassium ions in between. The layers in fine-grained micas are thus strongly bound together, preventing the type of expansion that characterizes smectite clays. So they do not expand like smectites. This potassium holds the layers together strongly, so they do not expand. The fine-grained micas are quite non-expansive, quite to indicate it's very. Remember, do not mix quiet. Quiet means calm. Please be quiet. Don't make noise. Don't, make, don't be loud. That's quiet. And quiet means very to indicate its large amount. So they are quite non-expansive, very non-expansive. Because of their non-expansive character, the fine-grained micas are more like kaolinite 
than smectites with regard to their capacity to absorb water and cations and their degree of plasticity, plasticity and stickiness. So, although they are two to one, but because they are non-expanding, they are closer in properties to, to kaolinite to one to one than the smectites, the expanding type. Of course, remember, when you don't have high surface area, of course, this will not have because their interlayer space is not there. They don't have interlayer space. So you expect the plasticity and stickiness to be low, like I have already told you earlier. The last group of the non-expanding two to one silicate minerals is the chlorides. In the two to one layers of soil chlorides, iron or magnesium rather than aluminum occupy most of the octahedral site. Remember when we talked first, when we started talking about the structure of the silicate claimants, when we talked about the octahedral, the octahedral sheet, we said it can have either aluminum and or magnesium. That means either aluminum alone, magnesium alone, or mixture. But also iron is very close in size to magnesium. So we can have also iron substituting magnesium in the octahedral sheet. In most chloride clays, a magnesium dominated trioctahedral hydroxide sheet is sandwiched in between adjacent two to one layers. So we have the original structure, two to one. Remember, the first number is always tetrahedral, octahedral. So we have two tetrahedral sheets and an octahedral sheet sandwiched between them. That will give you the crystal unit. And then the next crystal unit will be the same, two to one also. Between these two crystal units in chlorides, there is another octahedral layer, magnesium dominated trioctahedral hydroxide sheet. Sorry, sheet. So that sheet is between every two layers. Thus, chloride is sometimes called to have a two to one to one structure. Two tetrahedral, one octahedral, that's the original. And then right after it will be the magnesium dominated trioctahedral hydroxide. So another octahedral. So you have two tetrahedral, octahedral, octahedral. To indicate this octahedral is between the layers, but it becomes part of the mineral. Although it is a sheet besides or between the crystal units, the original crystal unit, it becomes part of this mineral. So also sometimes they refer to this mineral as two to two to indicate it has two tetrahedral sheets and two octahedral sheets. So each one has its different way of understanding, but they, they're all the same. If you say two to one, to one to indicate it's a two to one type. And then this is an external one that came between them. Or after it's formed, you say that now already it has two to two. So it doesn't make any difference. All of them will give you the same meaning when you think about it. Chlorides are non-expansive because the hydroxylated surfaces of an intervening magnesium octahedral sheet are hydrogen bonded to the oxygen atoms of the two adjacent tetrahedral sheets binding the layers tightly together. Remember, we have two to one, so you have tetrahedral, tetrahedral, octahedral, this one is in the center. So on the outside, you have tetrahedral and tetrahedral. When this comes in next to the tetrahedral, and it's an octahedral sheet, so it has hydroxyl groups, they will be hydrogen bonding, just like in the one to one, remember? tetrahedral, octahedral, they're attached together by hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonding in this one between the two tetrahedral and the next tetrahedral to it from the next layer or crystal unit. So it is tied by hydrogen bonding to two adjacent layers. So that holds them together very strongly. So we read again, chlorides are non-expansive because the hydroxylated surfaces of an intervening magnesium octahedral sheet 
are hydrogen bonded to the oxygen atoms of the two adjacent tetrahedral sheets. Two to one, that's a tetrahedral. Another two to one below it. Two to one, another tetrahedral. This one, the octahedral between them, binding the layers tightly together. The colloidal properties of the chlorides are therefore quite similar to those of the fine grain micas, of course, because they're not expanding. We expect them, we expect them to have very similar characteristics. Okay, we'll talk about this. We have already talked about it, but we will review quickly the sources of charges on soil colloids. There are two major sources of charges on soil colloids. The hydroxyl and other functional groups on the surfaces of the colloidal particles that by releasing or accepting hydrogen ions can provide either negative or positive charges. And then the charge imbalance brought about by the isomorphous substitution. We have seen how isomorphous substitution can be the uh, result of either positive or negative charges in silicate clays. In some clay crystal structures of one cation by another of similar size but differing in charge. We have already talked about it, but we'll talk about it a little bit more again. All colloids, organic or inorganic, exhibit the surface charges associated with the hydroxide ions charges that are largely pH dependent. We'll see how they the amount of those charges will depend on the pH of the soil. Most of the charges associated with humus, one-to-one -one type of clays, the oxides of iron and aluminum and allophane are of this type. So if you notice, we are not talking about two to one in this group. So most of these charges are stored, sorted where in humus, one to one type clay minerals, the hydroxide or the oxide of iron and aluminum clays, and the allophane, which is the amorphous type. The two to one usually do not have very much pH dependent type charges. Sorry. Okay, now we start with the constant permanent charges. Talk about them first, and then we talk about the pH dependent charges. This is repetition of what we have already covered. I'll go over it quickly. Isomorphous substitution could be the source of both negative and positive charges. Negative charges, a net negative charge is found in minerals where there has been an isomorphous substitution of a lower charged ion, example magnesium, divalent, for a higher charged ion, example aluminum. So divalent taking the place of trivalent. Such substitution commonly occurs in some aluminum dominated dioctahedral sheets. That's what mostly we is found in nature. This leaves an unsatisfied negative charge. If you go back to the isomorphous substitution when we talked about it, we are just repeating the same thing. The substitution of magnesium for aluminum is an important source of the negative charge on the smectite, vermiculite, and chloride clay micelles. The word micelle is the same as the crystal. When you have so many crystal units or layers together in nature, they form a particle or a micelle. You don't find individual layers or individual crystal units. Of course not. You find a large number of them getting together, attached together to form a micelle or to form a particle. Such a substitution is common in several of the important salt silicate clay minerals, such as the fine-grained micas, vermiculites, and even some smectites. We can have also, as we have seen earlier, positive charges from this isomorphous substitution. So isomorphous substitution can also be a source of positive charges if the substitution cation has a higher charge than the ion for which it substitutes. In a trioctahedral sheet, there are three magnesium ions surrounded by oxygen and hydroxyl groups, and the sheet has no charge. 
if an aluminum, which is a trivalent ion, substitutes for one of the magnesium divalent ion, a positive charge result, of course. Trivalent taking the place of divalent, so you have an extra charge, and that extra charge more than what is needed to neutralize the oxygen charges, so you would end up with a positive charge. In several 2 to 1 type silicate clays, including chlorides and smectite, substitution in both the tetrahedral and octahedral sheets can occur. Of course, it can happen in, in any of the sheets. The net charge in these clays is the balance between the negative and positive charges. So, in nature, we have both positive and negative charges due to the isomorphous substitution in all two to one type silicate clays. However, the net charge is negative. That's why, say, in the soils of Jordan, most of our soils contain two to one type silicate clays. So you don't expect on the two to one type silicate clays, silicate clays in nature a positive charge. Mostly they have net negative charge. That's why we always talk about cation exchange capacity. We do not talk about anion exchange capacity. Okay, the second type of the source of charges, which is the pH dependent charges. The second source of charges on some layer silicate clays, example, colonite and humus allophane, like we already said, and iron aluminum oxide clays, is depending, dependent sorry, on soil pH and consequently is termed a variable or pH dependent. That's why it's obvious what, we, what it means, pH dependent. It depends on the pH of the system because it depends on the pH of this. It's not constant, it's variable. As the pH changes, the amount of this charge also changes. Both negative and positive charges come from this source. So the same as likely we, we talked about the isomorphous substitution, we can have also negative or positive charges resulting from these also type of charges. The negative charges, the pH dependent charges are associated with hydroxyl OH groups on the surfaces of the inorganic and organic colloids. So wherever you have an OH on the surface, it has to be on the surface to be exposed to have a reaction, it has to be on the surface. If it's an internal one, of course, it's not available for reaction or change. Broken edges of mineral colloids also generate pH dependent charges. What do we mean by broken edges? When you have a micelle or a crystal, it's a combination of many, many, a large number of crystal units or layers. Of course, this does not keep on forever. Somehow it has to end the number of crystal units together somewhere, it will end. When it ends, that's the edge we call broken edge. It ended somewhere, so you have exposed edge, broken edge, where you can have some of these exposed functional groups like the hydroxide. The OH groups or oxygen atoms are attached to iron and or aluminum in the inorganic colloid. So these two lines indicate this is part of very large structure and this is where it ended. This is the surface of it. And on the carbon in humus, of course, humus, organic compound, it's built around the carbon atom. So you have carbon, whatever next to it, it could be uh, any type of organic structure. And on the surface, there is an OH. So these are functional groups, OH groups on the surface. Under moderately acid conditions, there is little or no charge on these particles. But as the pH increases, the hydrogen dissociates from the colloid OH group and negative charges results. So this is the group we talked about on the surface. Under neutral pH conditions, there will be no release or acceptance of any hydrogen. So it'll be neutral, zero charge. If the soil system becomes basic alkaline, you have more hydroxyl groups available. So this hydroxyl group will react with this hydrogen to form water. And of course, if this hydrogen leaves its position, it leaves behind it a negative charge. So 
higher pHs, alkaline conditions will result in the creation of negative charges. The same with the carbon, except instead of the OH connected to an inorganic element like aluminum, silicon, iron, whatever, it's connected to carbon. But the same thing happens. OH in alkaline conditions, this reacts with hydrogen to form water, and it leaves behind it a negative charge. The reactions are reversible. We see the two arrows, so they can go back and forth. That's why, depending on the pH, if the pH increases, more OH ions are available to force the reactions to the right, and the negative charge on the particle surfaces increases. We're producing more and more negative charges. If the pH is lowered, OH ions concentration are reduced, the reaction goes back to the left and the negative charge is reduced, of course. We can have also from these positive charges under moderate to extreme acid conditions. Now, instead of alkaline or basic conditions, we have acid conditions. Some silicate clays and iron aluminum oxide may exhibit net positive charges. The exposed OH groups are involved. Of course, they are the ones that are the reason for all this charge. In this case, however, as the salts become more acidic, which means high hydrogen, protonation, the attachment of hydrogen ions to the surface OH groups takes place. Instead of the OH earlier reacted with hydrogen to produce a net negative charge, here the hydrogen attaches to the OH and becomes OH2 plus carrying a positive charge. This is called protonation. Protonation, the addition of hydrogen. Whenever we talk about protonation in salt chemistry, you talk about the addition of hydrogen to a functional group. Thus, in some cases, the same site on the inorganic salt colloid may be responsible for negative charge, high pH, no charge, intermediate pH, or positive charge, very low, uh, very, very low pH. So that's why it's called pH dependent. The same site, depending on the pH of the system, can be neutral. We, saw, we have seen how it can be negative, and we have seen how it becomes positive. So you can have the same site, depending on this pH of the soil, neutral, negative, or positive. Okay, we'll stop here and we continue next lecture.